Hello, a very good morning to you and welcome to BBC Newsroom Live. I'm Anita McVeigh. A London schoolgirl who left Britain as a 15-year-old to join the so-called Islamic State group says she wants to come home. Speaking to the Times, Shamima Begum, who's now 19, married to an Islamic State fighter and nine months pregnant, says she wants to give birth in the UK. This morning, the security minister, Ben Wallace, told the BBC that anyone who joined IS must understand that actions have consequences. Chichi Izundu reports. Pictured for the first time in almost four years in a camp in northern Syria. Shamima Begum, one of the three schoolgirls from Bethnal Green who left to join the Islamic State group, which by then already had a murderous reputation. Just 15 when they went, she told the Times about their arrival in IS territory. We crossed the borders, they realised who we were, that, that we were the three girls, and they took us to a house. Uh, a man's house with his wife, and they didn't tell us why we were there. And then afterwards, uh, we found out that it was because they suspected we were spies. I was there for only three weeks, so after that I got married. She told the Times reporter Anthony Lloyd that her friend Khadiza Sultana was killed in an airstrike, but she said the third Bethnal Green girl, Amira Abbasay, was still alive two weeks ago. And Shamima Begum doesn't accept they made a mistake in joining the Islamic State group. Did you ever see executions? No, no, I never. Uh, no, but I saw a beheaded head in the bin. What was that like when you first saw that? These are the heads of captives? Yeah. I was, didn't pay me at all. But she does say while she was with IS, she lost two children through malnutrition and sickness. She's now nine months pregnant with a third child and is desperate to get back to the UK. I'm scared that this baby's going to get sick in this camp. That's why I really want to get back to Britain, because I know it will be taken care of. The Home Office says anyone taking part in conflict in Syria or Iraq must expect to be investigated by police to determine whether they've committed criminal offences and to ensure that they do not pose a threat to national security. Chichi Zindu, BBC News. Let's talk now with our correspondent Richard Galpin. Richard, what will the authorities here in the UK be doing with all of this information? Well, certainly, according to a very senior retired counterterrorism official, saying that uh, the police, the security services, will be starting to look at a mass of intelligence. Apparently, I mean, actually, as you'd expect, a lot of intelligence has been gathered about the people uh, who went into the so-called caliphate um, of ISIS. So there's a lot of information. Um, presumably, they might find some information about her. And, of course, the question will be, do they believe uh, that she has committed any offences, for example, travelling to an undesignated area which carries a hefty prison sentence, or uh, supporting a prescribed organisation, which of course so-called Islamic State is. So I think there's going to be very much um, an assessment of that. And already today um, we have heard from the Security Minister, Ben Wallace, and he's very clear what would happen to people coming back to this country having been part of uh, the caliphate. If you have been out there uh, against the advice of, of the Foreign Office to go and engaged in support or activities of terrorism, you should be prepared to be, if you come back, prepared to be questioned, investigated and potentially prosecuted for committing terrorist offences. Now, she's currently in a Syrian refugee camp. As you made very clear yesterday when you were on the World at One, there are no British officials, there are no diplomats who are in Syria at the moment. Is your view that until and unless she can find a British official, mm. She can say what she likes. She's not coming home. Well, we just don't provide consular services in Syria. You know, it's dangerous. I don't want to send British civil servants and officials out into a, you know, still active civil war uh, in, in, a, in effectively parts of a failed state. That is, that is why we don't provide that. Uh, well, Shamima Begum in this interview, Richard, isn't doing herself any favours, is she? Because she doesn't express any sense of regret over the last four years. She says that the only reason she wants to come back is because she wants her unborn baby uh, to have health care. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's basically her plea, isn't it? Um, she uh, says that she lost two very young children. They died of illnesses and uh, malnutrition. And she's uh, very, very worried that she will lose this child. She's nine months pregnant likely to give birth imminently so she wants to get back to the UK where the, the good health services uh, for that baby to be born safely. As far as we understand it 
uh, if she does have a British passport, then she should be able to make her way back to the UK if she can get through. Obviously, it's, it's a battlefield, it's a very difficult area. But as we heard uh, from the security minister, it's very likely then that she would, or she definitely would be, investigated. Okay, Richard, thank you very much. Richard Galpin. Well, earlier I spoke to Gina Vale, a research fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation at King's College London. She believes that although Shamima Begum has become desensitised to the violence of so-called Islamic State, she isn't necessarily a threat to our national security. We also need to consider the long-term effects of uh, refusing to repatriate civilians such as Shamima Begum or others, um, particularly when there are infants involved. Those infants are innocent. They were born into this situation through their parents' volition and choice to be there. And if we consider the long-term consequences of not repatriating civilians such as uh, herself and others, we then risk increasing the strain and burden on already overstretched facilities within Iraq and Syria. How much do you think the government considers the, the court of public opinion in this, if you like? Because clearly, uh, if you look at public opinion at the moment, people are saying, you know, she's made her bed, she has to lie in it. It's definitely a political issue and it's something of public interest, um, but that cannot be seen to influence policy, particularly with regard to her infant. If that infant is born inside um, Iraq or Syria in this case, then that infant has a right to British nationality and it is in our best interest to ensure that that child has those rights. Gina Vale there. Well, let's talk now to human rights campaigner Anita Prem, who's worked on radicalisation issues and forced marriage. Anita, thanks for joining us on Newsroom Live today. Uh, you will obviously have been taking stock of this story today. What are your initial thoughts uh, on the rights and wrongs of, of Shamima Begum being allowed to come back to the UK? She's a British citizen, but she made a choice as a very, very young girl, 15, with two of her friends to leave this country into a war-torn Syria and you know now she has very tragically lost two children, two babies and now she's got a third child on the way, wants to come back and have all the health care that needs to be afforded to this unborn child. She, she wasn't that young though was she? 15 is not that young and she's had four years uh, so is the situation any different now that she is saying age 19 she wants to come back as opposed to if she changed her mind much sooner? Well, you know, she's obviously being radicalised and I think the real threat needs to be how much of a danger she's going to be if she's back in the UK. But this unborn child is an innocent in all of this. I think we need to think about that too. You know, whether or not she comes back and is allowed to come back into the UK is a political decision, but she's a British citizen. Whether people like that or not, that is a fact. Some people will say, Yes, this unborn child absolutely is an innocent, but she made the choice to go there to become a, an IS bride. Um, she knew that potentially she would get pregnant. She would be bringing young children into the most dangerous of environments. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that ha has to come out of this, that it doesn't glamorise this situation, because there is no glamour in this. To see two children die from malnutrition and not having any health care is horrific. And now, when I've just seen the interview from the Times, it doesn't appear to be very much remorse that she's showing right now. So that's a real concern. And that other young people don't use her as a role model to want to go over to war-torn countries to fight against. British values, basically. Yes, looking at that interview, I was just about to come on to that. There is no sense, is there, that if she was to come back to the UK, that she would be wanting to send out a message to any other young woman who might be thinking of doing this, that, you know, this is a, a crazy idea, that it's wrong on every level. She expresses no regret. She talks quite casually about seeing a severed head in a bin and saying she wasn't phased by it. Uh, this sort of language is incredibly disturbing. And you've got to ask, you know, you talk about human rights. What about the human rights of people here in the UK who are living peacefully and, and don't want someone bringing that influence into the UK? I mean, you know, a number of women did go out as jihadi brides, and we don't know how many have come back illegally into this country either. And if she was to come back, would she spend a very long time in prison? We just don't know any of those answers. 
but she would have to get to a country where they would at least speak to British consul. But I think she would be of, of risk to all of us if she was to come back holding those same values that she does appear to have today. So this idea that she expresses in the interview of just wanting to come back and live quietly with her, her as yet unborn child, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a fantasy, isn't it? Well, I think, you know, there isn't anybody that wouldn't want to interview her to see her views, what she's doing, what life was like. And if there was real regret that she was very sorry and could express exactly how awful things were, maybe that would deter other people from wanting to go over. At the moment, it doesn't appear that's where she is at all. So on balance, you know, if, if she was to get to somewhere where she could travel back to the UK, on balance, do you think that it would be in the wider UK interest to have her stay there or to come back to the UK where she could be interviewed? I think she needs to be interviewed be overseas or in the UK, but while she poses a threat, that is a risk to all and each and every one of us. Okay, uh, human rights campaigner Anita Prem, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Well, uh, we're joined now by Sir Peter Fahi. He's the former uh, Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police and also National Lead of PREVENT, which is the government's anti-radicalisation strategy. Sir Peter, very good to have you with us this afternoon. Um, looking at this interview which Shamima Begum has given, uh, looking at the detail of what she said, the fact that she expresses no regret for the past four years, what, what do you make of her request to come back to the UK? I think it's naive, really, the idea that she thinks she could come back to the UK and have a normal life with her child. Um, it's really difficult to see how that could happen. I think the challenge in this case is just really its notoriety, the fact that it's generated so much public emotion and public anger, and therefore if she came back to the country, in particular, it would be a real challenge for the police force that had to try and keep her safe. What's the legal position, as you understand it? Well, the legal position is she's got a perfect right to come back to the country. Uh, but the likelihood is she would be detained at the port of entry. There would be an investigation um, as to whether there was enough evidence for her to be prosecuted. Uh, no doubt the uh, intelligence services have been gathering material while she's been in the ISIS territory. And then a decision would have to be made as to whether she'd be prosecuted or whether she needs to be monitored or whether she'd be suitable for something like the PREVENT program. But I say beyond that, really, you can see how she could be a threat to community cohesion, uh, because just the case generated so much public anger uh, and emotion um, and therefore undoubtedly extremists both from the right wing side and potentially the Islamic extremist side could use a case um, you know to, to, to obviously promote their own ideologies. There's clearly if you look at public opinion today a huge amount of opposition to the idea of her coming back to the UK given uh, that she left here when she was 15 um, and the fact that she seems to express no regret in this interview that she's given. Um, could her return be counterproductive to the Muslim community, do you think? Absolutely. I think that would be a concern. Um, you know, she, her case uh, sort of in a way symbolises a, 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 you know, a particular notion, uh, an extreme notion within the Islamic faith, but also a notion of somehow women uh, are there just to be chattels of men, to be their sexual slaves, and to just almost, uh, you know, produce more freedom fighters. And a lot of people will find that deeply offensive. You know, the reality is jihadi bride, this notion has been decried by many Muslim scholars. What it really is, is rape um, and forced marriage uh, and modern slavery. Uh, and so that's the difficulty in this case. You know, there are undoubtedly have been people who have been in the ISIS territory, who have come back into this country, have been investigated, have been monitored or been put on the pro prevent program but the challenge is just the notoriety of this case the fact it's generating so much publicity today and um, just makes it a particular challenge particularly complex and you couldn't really have somebody in this country who could end up as sort of being a, a spokesperson for isis in any way um uh, and, you know and, and been trying to promote uh, this particular ideology so um, although we've heard the security minister, Ben Wallace, say that if she was to come back, she clearly would be investigated. Do you think the government will be hoping actually that uh, th they don't have to, to deal with this, that she won't get to a place whereby she can travel back to the UK at all? I think so. You know, at the end of the day, everybody deserves a chance. I suppose a second chance deserves rehabilitation. But it's just the sheer complexity of this case, the emotions it generates. I think you're right. I think the authorities in general uh, will hope that she doesn't make it to our shores. From what you've read uh, and what you know of attempts to de-radicalise people who've been in this situation, 
uh, do you think she sounds like she could be a candidate for de-radicalization or uh, do you think her do indoctrination is, is complete, if you like? No, I think, you know, every, everybody is capable of rehabilitation. Um, she undoubtedly has been doctor indoctrinated. She has been brainwashed. Um, but it is, she's got to show a degree of openness. Things like the Prevent program are entirely voluntary. You can't force anybody to do it. So she'd have to show a willingness um, to, uh, you know, to be rehabilitated, to challenge her own views, her own thinking. And clearly in the interview so far, uh, it doesn't sound like she's in such a position. Okay, Sir Peter Fahey, uh, Sir Peter Fahey uh, Chief, uh, former Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, speaks for the police on the government's prevent strategy as well. Well, our correspondent Anissa Kadri is in Bethnal Green in East London for us. And Anissa, what have people been saying to you? Well, this is a very multicultural part of London, an area that Shamima Begum knew so well before she left for Syria four years ago. And there's a large Asian community here. Many of them have been telling me that what Shamima Begum did going to Syria, joining the so-called Islamic State, well, she says, they say to me, it doesn't represent them and it does not represent their Muslim faith either. Where they're divided, though, is what should happen when she, if, if and when Shamima Begum comes back to Britain. Some of them say she joined a murderous group, she should stay out there, she hasn't appeared particularly remorseful. Others, though, say she was 15 when she left for Syria, she should be given the benefit of the doubt. And that was, in fact, the view of one of the, uh, the students who went to the same school as her at the time. Well, uh, the school is just in that direction over there, where Shamima Begum went to school. And I've been actually speaking to a few students who went to that school. So one of them said to me that she should be given the benefit of the doubt. Another one said to me that now that she should, uh, that, that what happened to Shamima Begum isn't representative of the community, but they're following what happened closely. OK, Anissa, many thanks. Well, our correspondent Mark Lowen is in Erbil in northern Iraq. And Mark, what more do we know about where Shamima Begum was found? Well, Rita, Shamima Begum is in our whole refugee camp, which is some 150 miles west of where I am at the moment, across the Syrian border. It is an area of uh, a Syria that was held for some time by the Islamic State group and then was captured by Kurdish fighters back in 2015. The Al Hol refugee camp has about 35,000 people in it. The conditions are pretty wretched, as you can imagine. And Shamima Begum was among the truckloads of civilians who have been evacuated in recent days and weeks from Baghuz, that is, the last patch of territory held by the Islamic State group in eastern Syria, close to the Iraqi border. It is really the last desperate gasp of the group before it implodes. So the, f the fighting there is extremely fierce. Uh, a few hundred IS fighters are holed up in just a couple of villages. They have dug tunnels. There are suicide bump bombers. Bear in mind, Rita, that uh, IS once controlled a territory the size of Britain, and it's just down to this last patch of territory now. Now, when it falls, which is imminent in the next possibly hours or couple of days, Donald Trump Trump is likely to declare victory against IS. He will say that 100% of the self-declared caliphate of IS has been liberated. But here in Iraq, Rita, IS is not over. There are still sleeper cells, there are guerrilla attacks, there's low-level insurgency that could continue for some years to come. IS has not ended, the fighters have dispersed, and that, in many ways, will be much harder to deal with. OK, Mark, thank you. Mark Lowen there. Lisa Kadri, let's talk to our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, who joins me now from the newsroom. Gordon, the difficulty for all the security forces, services and the police is working out exactly if she's done anything wrong. Well, that's right, because the officials, ministers have made clear that if she returns to the UK, uh, she will be assessed to see whether she has committed any serious criminal acts. But the challenge is really knowing that and even more so being able to prove it, uh, because the challenges of uh, collecting admissible evidence from Syria are enormous. And so even though there may be suspicions about what she may have done and whether it, some of it may have constituted criminal acts, being able to have evidence uh, that you could bring to court to prosecute may be a challenge. So I think there is this question about what may happen. In some cases there have been prosecutions of those returning, so it is certainly not impossible uh, that that could happen. But there are also uh, difficulties in being able to, to bring about any kind of prosecution and to know exactly what someone was doing when they were out there. 
If she does come back, there's a newborn baby to be considered. There's also the issue of whether she becomes a, a lightning rod, if you like, for those pro and anti-ISIS. Well, that's right. I mean, she is certainly going to be one of the most visible, well-known returnees if she was to come back. And so I think there would then be questions about how she could live, what circumstances she could live in, even if she was not prosecuted. So there are a lot of challenges here to think about. And I think it's worth saying that she perhaps is, is, is one of the most famous people who's gone out uh, to, uh, to Iraq and Syria and to, to go and, and join the caliphate as she saw it. But there are many others as well. And there are many others who will have been held uh, by the Kurdish forces or who may at some point in the very near future come into their hands as those last pockets of ISIS territory collapse. And so I think lots of countries are starting to face up to these quite serious challenges, which is what you do not just with foreign fighters, but with their children, with those that they married, with those that went out where you suspect they may have been involved, but you're not sure they were involved. There are a whole host of challenges there for a lot of countries. And Shamima Begum's case is just really one of those, and perhaps one of the more, more high-profile examples of these cases. And of course, she was a child herself when she went out there. She was only 15. That's right, and that's led to some people to say, well, what kind of responsibility does she have? Of course, she stayed out there, and I think it's notable in her interview, she says she doesn't regret uh, having gone out there. And I think balancing those different uh, issues, her, her uh, original motivation and age, and her staying out there, and the reasons why she now says she wants to come back, I think will be important and part of that assessment about what kind of uh, a risk she might pose and uh, uh, what risks she might face if she were to come back. Gordon, thank you very much. That's Gordon Carrera, our security correspondent. Let's get more now from our correspondent, uh, Richard Galpin. And Richard, of course, she's nine months pregnant, so if she does come back, there's going to be a baby that's going to be a priority for social services, certainly, while they decide what to do with her mother or his mother. Yes, that's right. And um, she's saying that she's nine months pregnant, so it's absolutely imminent. And obviously her priority at the moment is to try and to get somewhere uh, where she can give birth uh, to that baby safely. And uh, obviously the journey back to Britain is going to be a long and difficult one because she's clearly not going to get any help from the British authorities. So she's going to have to make her way uh, either into Turkey or to Iraq and then try and get back uh, to Britain. As I say, it's, it's going to be a difficult journey for her. Everything depends on whether police or the authorities decide if she's done something illegal. That, that's absolutely the key thing, is that she, can, she absolutely has the right to come back to Britain, but when she gets back to Britain, then for sure, uh, the police uh, will start an investigation and uh, they'll be looking to see if she has committed any terrorist uh, offences. And obviously that could be quite a, a long process, but potentially, uh, if she is found guilty of any terrorist offences, then she could uh, be sent to jail and obviously then be a question what, what would happen to her child. She was 15 when she went. Her parents didn't know she'd been radicalised. Uh, is there a sense that her age may become an issue with all this? Yes, cause, um, absolutely, because she's now uh, 19 years old. If she'd been uh, less than 18, uh, then it would not be so difficult. But now she can be uh, held responsible. So it's, uh, it's a very, very difficult, uh, very different uh, situation which she faces um, as an adult, having spent five years uh, in the caliphate. So what happens now? Well, obviously, uh, we have to wait and see what, what she does, but um, we're hearing from some officials that obviously they'll be looking uh, at the intelligence material. Apparently, there have been a lot of sources uh, from within the caliphate uh, for Western intelligence agencies, and they'll be trying to look and see exactly whether, or to find if there is any record of what she was doing at the time and whether there is anything suspicious about um, the activities she was or potentially involved in whilst within the caliphate. And Richard, if she does come back, presumably there'll be, there'll be a cost to police because she's going to be a lightning rod for those who are pro or indeed anti-Islamic State. Yes, that's right. I mean, that, that is going to be difficult. And of course, uh, we know that uh, there are many people who are now fleeing out of this final pocket uh, of the caliphate in Baghouz in eastern Syria. There are very large numbers. How many are British, of course, we don't know, but clearly there are some and plenty of other foreign fighters and jihadi brides um, who've been coming out of the area in recent days. Richard, thank you much. That's Richard Gulp in there in our newsroom. Let's go to our correspondent, Mark Lowen, who's in Erbil in northern Iraq, joins me now. And if there's one good piece of news, if you'd like, to come out of this, uh, this interview with her, it is that the days of the caliphate are, are clearly numbered. 
Yeah, they're numbered. The hours are numbered, I think, as well, Simon. Uh, the fighting is very fierce indeed in Baghuz and around Baghuz. This last patch of territory held by the Islamic State group in eastern Syria near the Iraqi border. Just a couple of villages now where uh, a few hundred IS uh, fighters are holed up. They uh, have dug tunnels. There are suicide bombers. So this is the last desperate gasp for the group before it implodes. And when it does fall, which is going to be within a matter of hours or, or a few days, uh, then uh, Donald Trump is expected to declare victory. He will say that 100% of the, of the self-declared caliphate of uh, the Islamic State group uh, has been uh, recaptured. But of course, that does not mean the end of IS. According to a latest UN report, there are still some 18,000 fighters um, and sympathizers of, of IS in Syria and Iraq. And of course, the issue with that is where will they go? Yeah, I mean, I, I was speaking to some sources here who said that, you know, that it's, it, it, they have not ended, they have not disappeared, the IS fighters, they have dispersed. And that is much harder to deal with. Uh, there, uh, there are sleeper cells here in Iraq. Uh, there is low-level insurgency. There are guerrilla attacks that are pretty regular. Uh, there are allegations from the Kurdish authorities that um, IS fighters have integrated within the security structures of the Iraqi army, Iraqi military and militias as well. And therefore, they are committing attacks often at night with weapons and uniforms uh, provided to them as part of a militia or security services. Um, and, uh, and that is much, much harder then to deal with, especially because, of course, over in Syria, Donald Trump is preparing to withdraw U.S. troops. Uh, so with, uh, with U.S. troops out in Syria and with, a, a frankly, a kind of political commitment to Iraq waning in Washington and London and elsewhere, uh, then it's left to the Iraqi, the, the Iraqi forces here to try to deal with these pockets of IS that still remain. And uh, it doesn't seem that they have the capacity really to do that. So relief on the one hand, but incredible nervousness on the other. Yeah, I mean, there is fear here. Um, uh, there, I mean, I was at a camp for internally displaced people just a couple of days ago from Mosul, and, and, and people there were saying that they still don't feel secure enough to return to Mosul, even though it was liberated from IS over a year ago um, because of these sleeper cells and because, of course, Mosul was very, very destroyed. So when you have poverty, when you have the destruction of war, well, that is breeding ground for radicalization. So the fear is, of course, that um, these new sleeper cells could develop into an IS Mark II in the, in the months and years to come. Mark, is there a sense among the diplomats, others that you speak to, that perhaps Donald Trump, if he does say what you think he's going to say, is jumping the gun here? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a, the feeling among that uh, f from, from diplomats and from other sources. Um, I mean, in, in, I'm usually based in Turkey. In Turkey, they're delighted because they feel that uh, with U.S. troops out of Syria, well, then Turkish troops could, could launch an incursion into Syria against Kurdish fighters who, these, who they see as terrorists. Bear in mind, Simon, those Kurdish fighters are the same fighters that the U.S. has depended on to fight and destroy uh, the Islamic State Caliphate in Syria. So, so uh, Turkey is looking forward to the U.S. To, with, with Withdrawal. They want to launch a military incursion into, into Syria. But, uh, but other Western diplomats very much, I think there is a feeling that, that uh, Donald Trump has jumped the gun on this and that this withdrawal is premature. A Pentagon report saying that, um, uh, that within six to 12 months, there could be a resurgence of IS if there is a lack of commitment to fighting the group. Mark, good to talk to you. Mark Lowen there in Erbil Thank from you. Westminster on that vote. Uh, scheduled to start around five o'clock and then the results sometime just after seven. You're watching Afternoon Live. Let's return to our main story and discuss Shamima Begum's case. That's the British woman who ran away to join fighters from the Islamic State group in Syria four years ago and now wants to return to Britain. Let's talk now to Elizabeth Pearson, who's from the defence think tank, the Royal United Services Institute, also lecturer in cyber threat at the Research Centre at Swansea University. Thank you for joining us. What will authorities here be trying to work out about what she's been doing? Well, we, we don't know yet what will happen to her. We don't know whether she'll be returning here. Um, but she's not, she might be a high profile case, as indeed everybody remembers that image of the Bethnal Green girls. But she's not the only case. And we have had cases, not many, but some, of returners coming back. So when they come back, it's a multi agency approach um, a police investigation looking for um, possible criminal prosecution. Um, mental health services tend to be involved, social services, there's an array of different services who are used to assess risks and uh, work out what to do next with the people that come back. A lot of people might wonder why there's a question as to whether she's done something wrong, given that she went to Syria and effectively joined Daesh. It's illegal to travel to join Daesh, it's support of Daesh, membership of Daesh is, is a criminal offence. Um, some people do not think that she should be coming back. 
and other people think that she is a victim of, um, of Daesh in the first place. We remember she was 15 years old when she travelled over there. She's been there for four years, she's still only 19 years old. And in all the cases, and they're all different, we have to think about the responsibilities um, and the agency, how much they knew what they were getting into um, when they went over there. In cases we've had across Europe, actually, of people coming back, they've been quite keen to distance themselves from Daesh ideology. Well, the, clearly she isn't, she because she is been. expressing no remorse at all. That's right. So she's quite unusual in that. And of course, you know, a lot of people have said the stories of people saying, we thought Daesh was a humanitarian organization. We thought we were going to be helping Syrians. We didn't know about the other things. You know, there has been a degree of cynicism. Now, she's not saying that. Uh, interestingly, what, what she sees, um, as the end for her was the oppression, this disillusionment with what Daesh was, was doing, and also the fact that she thinks it's now over. We're in a situation of some chaos. Um, there is still violence being carried out by Daesh, but she sees it as the end. And she cited, obviously, the protection of her, of her infant as a reason why she wants to come back. One aspect that people are looking at and talking about, of course, is her age, 15, as you say, when she went out there. But the fact is, she's also female, and that, that yes. changes this, doesn't it? Um, I don't know that it changes what, the things that we should be asking, because in every case, male or female, we need to think about how the gender, the sex of that person um, influenced and, and was shaped, shaped the, what they did with Daesh. But we do know that Daesh had a specific recruitment strategy back in 2015. Online recruitment absolutely targeted at young women Women just like her, women who were looking for adventure, a sense of Islamic belonging, a place where they could wear an akab and burqa freely, and of course this, this promise of um, people to marry. So we do know that IS, IS Daesh was um, absolutely active and using um, techniques on the internet which we've seen and are familiar from child sexual exploitation and grooming. Now it's not just young women who were vulnerable to this young men also. So all of these things have to be considered because there's a, a lot of complexity and a lot of nuance around um, the situation, even though she's been there for four years and, and that we think we know. There will be a concern if she does come back that she will be, she's, uh, she's, uh, her face is everywhere, that she becomes a lightning rod, if you like, not just for those who perhaps support the Islamic State or, or those ideals, but those who actually really don't, that she, that's going to be a cost in, in just protecting her. It shouldn't it? be a factor in, in, in bringing her back those kinds of considerations. Um, this is a consideration of the responsibility to a UK citizen, even as she four years ago wanted to renounce that. Those things are to be dealt with as practicalities. Were she to return, um, and that, that shouldn't be a factor in what What about the fact that back. she will have, as we know, a newborn baby, maybe weeks, months old, we don't know. Well, there are safeguarding issues around, and that's, that's, one, of the, um, that's one of the themes in terms of um, looking at cases of women who've come back with children, is um, the safety of the child, what the future of that child should be, where that child is, is best placed. Um, you know, we shouldn't lose faith in the idea of de-radicalization programs. At the moment, from the very little that we have seen um, overnight and from the Times re uh, report, it doesn't seem as though she's at all repentant. But there are um, programs in place in order to engage with people who are ideologically radicalized to Daesh and uh, to the idea of uh, Sharia. And there is the possibility of, of those kinds of interventions when people return. But ju just briefly, finally, when you read that interview for the first time, what, when you've read it, what was your impression on, it, on a human level about her? I think, you know, obviously listening to her voice, a, a quite young sounding London voice, it is it's shocking. And I've seen a lot of shocking material, but it's still shocking every time, I think. But it's not normal for us, but unfortunately this has become, so, this is normal for, for a conflict zone, this is normal for Daesh. And I think we have to try and um, de take the emotion out of these situations and try and consider these cases in a uh, rational and a lawful manner and proceed in, in that way. However emotive this whole subject and however the bar barbaric and brutal the activities taking place in Iraq and Syria under Daesh. Dr. Elizabeth Pearson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get more from our correspondent, Richard Gulpin, who joins me now from the newsroom. And a lot is going to, f is going to focus, Richard, on, on what it is she's done while she's been out in Syria. 
I think that's absolutely uh, the question and certainly what we've been hearing from some officials is that um, they expect the police to start sort of trawling any intelligence um, and obviously the security service as well, any intelligence which might guide them uh, in a particular di direction. Has she done something which would break Britain's uh, terrorism laws? And, but the question, you know, Simon, is, is whether, even if you manage to do that, um, whether you're able to get the kind of evidence which would be admissible in court if there were to be uh, any case brought against her. And I think the thing is it's uh, very, very difficult uh, to get that uh, evidence and to be able to use it. The thing is, Richard, at the moment it would appear there's very little remorse that, that she would probably tell them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, absolutely. I think that's one of the sort of very striking things in, the, in this interview is that she says very clearly um, she has no regrets and it was as she expected uh, and that she hadn't been phased by the sight of several heads in a bin, um, obviously men who'd been fighters, enemy fighters, those who, uh, who'd been murdered. So uh, absolutely uh, no remorse from that point of view. What she's been stressing is her desire to come back uh, to this country, particularly now uh, that she's about to have have um, another child having lost two children who both died uh, whilst in the caliphate. And of course she was 15 when she left the United Kingdom and there are those who are pointing out quite rightly that she was the victim of grooming. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and um, there are a number of people who are saying that uh, very, very clearly. The counter-argument is they're saying that she's now 19 and therefore an adult, uh, and some people uh, alleging that she is very much a jihadi bride and has uh, been radicalised, and that's obviously what also now to, needs to be worked out by the police as to whether, uh, if she were to come back to this country, if she would pose any kind of risk or not. And Richard, if she does come back and the investigation finds that she is guilty of some crimes, what sort of sanctions would she face? Well, uh, potentially, if she were to be found guilty of being a member of, for example, of, of uh, the ISIS state group, then they are long prison sentences. I think it's around about 10 years. So, absolutely, there are very, very heavy penalties uh, if she were to be found guilty of, of any of these offences. Richard, thank you very much. That's Richard Gulp in there in our newsroom. Let's return to our main story. Now, the father of one of the three teenage jihadi brides from East London who joined Islamic State has broken down in tears at the news that his daughter may still be alive. Hassan Abbas appealed to the British government to bring home his daughter Amira Abbas and her friend Shamima Begum. He was speaking to our Home Affairs correspondent Dominic Kashiani. The message for government is to let the teenagers into UK. As a teenager they can do something wrong and from that angle the government need to understand and give them uh, into UK and what, give them lessons. Yeah. What, what do you think about what they did? Do you, do you think they did what they did because they were extremists, they were dangerous, or was it the mistake of a child? Okay, for that, things they have to know because they, they know why they left the country, go there. So we will know it when they get here. But, When's our question? Yeah. But did, did you ask your daughter yourself in these text messages why she left? No, no, it was very difficult to communicate. Yeah. So Even I don't want to raise this issue. So, what matter for us as a family is that she's alive, and we don't want to touch that side. It until must, yeah. It, it must be quite, quite an emotional moment for the family today. Yeah. It's very, very emotional. And, and, and your message to the police, because if, if, if Miss Begum gets back and perhaps your daughter, you know, they, they all want to investigate and possibly take, take them to court for going to join IS. Um, I mean, what's your message to the police? Uh, not to do that, because as um, I explained to you, they are teenagers, they can be influenced, they are vulnerable with the... Uh, uh, this digital world that we live with the internet, uh, so many things can happen. They have to show from that perspective. So who, who, who do you think influenced them? Was it somebody here in the community or was this something which was happening online? Yeah, I really cannot tell exactly who influenced, but so many uh, things involved. Uh, community can be online, so many things can happen. But as a family, what I can say is we don't uh, make her to do something like that. So uh, we want them to have a bright future. 
when I think from now, if the government cannot do something, we'll be very uh, sad and sorry. But I think that won't be happen. I think so. I'm positive. You, you think the government will step in? Yeah, yeah. I'm positive. And, and in, in relation to your daughter, I mean, do you, do you know if she had any children out there? No, no, no. You, you, no. you don't, you don't no, know that? No. So you, you've, really, you've really got the no... The information I have is she's still alive. And that must fill your heart with joy. Yeah. Um, if, if, if your daughter turned up in the refugee camp, yeah. yeah, I mean, what would you do yourself? Never stay one minute here if I can't go fly there to see her. And when you see her, what would you say to her? I don't know. This is too long. And I guess that's why you want the government to step in. Yeah. Do you feel they have a duty to your family to, to, to now help you? Excuse me? Do you, do, you, do you feel the government must help you and your family? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. No question about it. Because if they don't help you, then you'll never see your daughter again, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Again, it's, inshallah, as I said, is. Tomorrow is another day. Yeah. You, you know that the, some journalists have reported about your own political activity mm -hmm. and about the fact you've taken part in oh, marches okay. against America, yeah. you know, yeah. is, Islamist causes, yeah, yeah. and they've said that you know you you started the process that led to your daughter going to Syria. I mean, do do you regret anything you've personally done? Yeah, innocently maybe I did something. Yeah, of course, some things are I'm regretting. Yeah. I mean, what what things would you regret? What things do you regret? I mean, the, what I regret is the demonstration I take part. Because what I think is is a free country, is a democracy. I did it, but it turned out differently. I regret it in that way. And if people say that what you took part in leads to support for Islamic State, what would you say about that? Uh, no, I have nothing to do with that. Yeah. Uh, has no impact at all what's happened to my daughter. I have no that feeling. Okay. Yeah. Again, what will happen is happen. So. <laughs> I don't battle with myself, you know, that will kill me. It's just, it's just enough that she needs. I'll, I'm positive, I mean, uh, open and to see if something, yeah. It's a decree again, if I can meet her, it's okay. If not, very sad. You cannot tell, yeah. Okay. This life is not calculated, I mean, so. Well, that was Abbas Hassan talking to Dominic Kashiani. Let's speak now to Hena Rai, who's founder and director of Women Against Radicalization Network in Birmingham. And I think we've probably just seen a very strong advocate for part of the argument against uh, Shmima Begum facing uh, any sort of punishment, and, and that's her age. She was only 15 when she went out there. Yes, that's right. Um, I mean, I remember when this happened, I remember the discussions we had, how we spoke about it, both um, in a counter-extremism uh, perspective and um, from the vulnerability side as well. It's really important to understand that these were 15-year-old girls who were effectively groomed online by uh, predators and, um, and people who used to he, he used their vulnerabilities to manipulate them and influence them in taking that godforsaken decision to go over to Syria. And yet, and you will be aware that there is a lot of anger out there that someone can go out to Syria, mm -hmm. join Islamic State, mm -hmm. and well, we don't know what she has done with them or for the fighters, and that's subject to an investigation. But yes. she is now wanting to come home. Do you think she should face some sort of investigation? 
Absolutely. I mean, we have a legal and moral duty towards her. Um, unequivocally, I um, support what Ben Wallace said, that there would be consequences. However, in addition to that, what I would also say, we need to understand her mindset. Now, bearing in mind that she was 15 years old at the time she took this decision and she made the trip to Syria, she's now 19, there will be vulnerabilities in place. When you look at her uh, body language and the way she spoke, you can understand quite clearly, particularly with somebody who's been working in this arena, that what she is repeating is what she has been taught and she has not been given any alternative narratives. She hasn't been given any other um, representation of what's happened to her. It's only what she has seen over these past four years. And that's where we need to step in and we have that duty of care towards her whilst we need to um, ensure she's aware of the consequences of her actions. At the same time, we need to f provide that support. There's, a, there's a, still a 15-year-old child in, in her crying out for this support and this is something we cannot ignore. I'm just wondering, because we have seen this before, I'm thinking of the case, I think it was uh, Tarina Shaquille yes. who came back and was jailed for six years for, yes. uh, for belonging to Islamic State, but again, this is an age issue, is it, because she was 26? Now, again, Tarina Shaquille had other vulnerabilities. She had come from a broken marriage. She had uh, come from a background of domestic violence. She was looking for companionship. She was looking for support. And she sought this online, where she end up, ended up falling into a trap. We see similar similarities here, where there's vulnerabilities, where there's seeking companionship, where they're seeking an outlet to express themselves. Now, when these jihadis um, start uh, grooming these girls online, they don't talk about the state. They don't talk about the Islamic duty and khilafah. But that all happens once they're there. What they do to, uh, speak to them about is how beautiful they find them, how they understand them, how there's a personal connection, how they love them, how they're going to offer them um, a lifestyle um, that is going to be akin to almost Disneyland um, or, or living like a queen where they'll be um, served on hand and foot. The girls fall for this and feel that these these predators are actually genuine in what they are saying and end up taking that drastic step. It's no different to the victims of gang-based grooming or CSE-based grooming here in England. It's the same mindset and the same vulnerabilities in play here. One issue that's come out from her interview with The Times and an issue that a lot of people are very angry about, listen to the radio phone-in programs today, she's shown no remorse, she has no regret, she's coming back to Britain, frankly because she wants to make sure that her baby's okay. Now, what we need to understand here is she has been through a great deal of trauma. She's lost two young children under the age of one. Um, that would have had a great impact on her. Normally, when, when a person is in a conflict zone or a zone uh, or a war zone, they become desensitized to what's happening around them. I'm going to take you back a few years um, to when the Taliban was rife in um, Afghanistan. Young boys were interviewed by the BBC, and, and these were boys from the ages of nine until about 12. And they were speaking about how they used to see heads dropping like footballs and one of them even turned around and said well one, one day we did, our football broke and we didn't have anything to play with so we played with a head and used it as a ball they become desensitized you become detached to what your surroundings are it's but, like a defense mechanism but, but how much responsibility do those youngsters a 15 year old take for their actions a 15 year old who is old enough to work out she's going out to Syria I know you're, you're going to say she's been brainwashed but at what point does she have to carry some responsibility for her actions? And, and as we said, we, we don't actually know what she's done while she's been out there, uh, but it, it could be anything. Well, a, a person who's been brainwashed and manipulated will never turn around and admit to that until much later on. It takes a great deal of counselling, working with them, um, support and investigation for them to actually turn around and say, actually, yes, this is what I went through. It's going to be exactly the same with Shamima. Secondly, with regards to the consequences, by no means am I, um, am I saying that there shouldn't be any consequences to her actions and she should be aware of this and this is where our 
um, our standing as um, as our legal and moral duty towards her, as well as her human rights. She has the right to be tried fairly and justly according to the laws of this country, and it's unfair for us to expect um, Syria, Iraq, or the Kurds to turn around and do this. They are under enough pressures. We actually have a legal and moral duty um, towards uh, Shamima Begum and others who may be returning. And earlier on, I was on uh, BBC Radio 4 with Sarah Montague, and the head, uh, the, the head of uh, MI6, Richard Barrett, actually agreed with me on this, that we do have a legal moral duty, and we cannot ignore that. Hannah Rye, it's very good of you to join us. Thank you very much for your Thank time you. this afternoon. Thank you very much. Well, let's discuss this now with uh, Dr. Catherine Brown, who's Senior Lecturer in Islamic Studies at the University of Birmingham. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. So some people will say, um, Shamima Begum, she, uh, she chose to leave Britain. She chose to turn her back on Britain and, and go to so-called Islamic State. What, why should Britain feel obliged to take her back? Well, I think in, there's one really simple answer, which is international law and our requirement to uphold international human rights, which are part and parcel of our British values, say that you cannot render someone stateless. That means, as a British citizen, she has the right to return back to the UK and face justice and the consequences of her actions, but nevertheless, as a British citizen and as part of our British values, upholding her human rights and showing that we're better than the terrorists who don't, mm is one of the main reasons why she should be allowed to return home and as appropriate face justice. And again some viewers watching this might say you know, she could potentially be dangerous, um, she may have been brainwashed. Mm -hmm. We need to take that into consideration and we need to look at how we can minimise any potential risk that she may pose. But we also need to be cautious about overhyping whatever threat we might fear from her. Again, ISIS really want to sow the seeds of fear within our society. And we can look at past uh, examples of returnees and we can see that from past returnees, um, only one in 360 of those have ever carried out attacks back in their homelands afterwards. And an even longer study dating back to the 1980s right the way through to 2010 shows that less than 11% of those returning home attempt to carry out any act of violence when they return home. So we can minimise the risks, we also need to put it into perspective and again we need to work with her to see what might be the most appropriate way of responding to her should she return. Do, do you think then she could be in some ways rehabilitated into British society? I think if we look at one of the foundational principles of our legal system, it is on this basis that everyone has the potential to be rehabilitated and reintegrated. And I think those processes, and we have examples of them in the past, uh, we can look at Northern Ireland, for example, but we can also look at contemporary examples from Boko Haram to Al-Shabaab, or even far-right movements, the exit programs that run in Germany and Scandinavia. We can use those as examples for successful ways of rehabilitating and reintegrating former members of extremist groups and we have a track record of doing that so yes it is possible it can be organized and I think that we can demonstrate that we're stronger than terrorist organizations by considering this and finding an appropriate way for her to uh, return home. And might it also be important to talk to her to try and understand or try and get into her mindset when she was 15 how she was radicalized to the extent that she not only sympathise with Islamic State, but she ran away, ran away from home, ran away from Britain to Syria to join, to join IS. Absolutely. It's oversimplified to say that she was brainwashed or just duped or that she fell in love or was sexually groomed or whatever online. We need to understand her pathway. There, are, there is no common or standard route into joining terrorist organisations or becoming radicalised, just as there is no one way of leaving a group. So yes, we need to look at why she did it, how she did it. Uh, we can learn from that and then from that understand as well what package can best be put into place to ensure sure that she doesn't do it again. Interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Catherine Brown, their senior lecturer in Islamic studies at the University of Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to BBC Newsroom Live. I'm Carrie Gracie. The Home Secretary has said he'll do everything in his power to prevent the return of a teenage girl from East London who ran away to Syria to join the Islamic State group. Sajid Javid says if 19-year-old Shamima Begum does come back to the UK, she could be prosecuted. Her family have appealed for compassion, saying she was very young when she made the decision to leave four years ago. Ben Andrew reports. 
There are nearly 40,000 in this camp. More arrive each day as their dreams of an Islamic State caliphate crumble. Among them, Shamima Begum from Bethnal Green. Now 19 and nine months pregnant with her third child, she says she has no regrets about what she did and what she saw. Did you ever see executions? No, no, no. Uh, no, but I saw the head head in the bin. What was that like when you first saw that? These are the heads of captives? Yeah. I was, didn't pay me at all. Shamima and two friends left the UK in 2015. One is now dead, the other missing. But the Home Secretary doesn't want her back. He told the Times newspaper, We must remember that those who left Britain to join Daesh were full of hate for our country. My message is clear. If you have supported terrorist organisations abroad, I will not hesitate to prevent your return. Shamima is not alone. The government estimates that 900 people travelled from the UK to engage in conflict in Syria and Iraq. Around 180, or one in five, are known to have been killed, while twice that number, 360, have already returned to the UK, with the same number still unaccounted for. And if Shamima is one of those who makes it back, she can expect to be questioned and possibly prosecuted. But will she lose her British citizenship? Her family are asking for compassion, but some are urging the authorities to take a harder line, saying that actions should have consequences. Ben Ando, BBC News, at the Home Office. Well, let's get more now from our correspondent, Richard Galpin. Some very difficult choices and a kind of complex decision-making. Yeah, absolutely. But it's obviously the government has set out its stall, saying very clearly they want to try and stop her coming back um, to the UK. And they're talking about various different options. One is to simply cancel her passport. Another, even tougher measure, would be to strip her of her nationality. Um, and then the third option is this temporary ban, whereby she wouldn't be allowed to come uh, into th this country until she's agreed to be investigated and monitored and to enter into a de-radicalisation programme. So all of those options seem to be out there, but um, nothing which has definitely been concluded as far as we know. There are, of course, uh, questions about this, because under international law, I think, um, you cannot render a citizen stateless. Yeah, well, that was going to be my question to you. How can they keep her out other than by the temporary order? Well, they seem to think they have a work around, a work away around option to that, um, particularly if they can establish that there's any sense of dual nationality. If a dual national, definitely you can strip of one of those nationalities. So I think that's what they're looking at at the moment. Um, and then there's questions, of course, around her unborn child. There's questions around whether it would be useful to um, be able to question her and kind of reverse engineer the thinking that goes into this kind of radicalisation. So some people are saying, actually, the incentives are more complex than the government is presenting. Yes, but obviously um, she could be questioned. Um, intelligence could be gleaned from her outside of Britain. That wouldn't have to be done in Britain. I mean, it, for example, it could be done in Turkey if she gets out to Turkey and goes to... Uh, one of the consulates in that country or in Iraq um, is another route which she could take. She could all, you know, that could all take place outside of Britain. What about the unborn child then? Because, you know, is, is there a rights of the child issue here? Well, I think absolutely, yes. And obviously, if she came back uh, to the UK, one thought is that if necessary, that child uh, could become a ward of court and could, there be, could actually be placed in care and looked after by another family. And um, is this case now an isolated one? Is it the only one like this we're going to see? Or as the noose tightens around those last um, IS enclaves in northeast Syria, are we going to see more? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, as we know, um, tens of thousands of people have appeared, have gone to this uh, camp al Alawal um, in uh, northeastern Syria. So there are a very uh, significant number of those people are foreigners from all sorts of different countries, obviously including some from Britain. So it is likely that more people will appear in the coming days. Richard, thank you. Mark Liverbone. Now, let's go back to our top story. And joining us now is uh, the case, uh, on the case of Shamima Begum. Um, joining us uh, now is uh, the uh, d criminal defense lawyer, Ama Anwar. Um, Thank you very much for talking to Good us. Good morning. Um, now, this case, um, actions have consequences, say the British government, mm -hmm. hence the decision not to let her come back. Is this a decision you agree with? 
Well, I, I don't think they've said that not to let it come back. What they've said is that they're not going to be um, risking the lives of British civil servants to travel out to Syria at a risk of their own life to try and bring her back. If she reaches a British consulate or embassy in Turkey, then um, of course she um, will be allowed to come back because um, Britain, of course, is signatory to international obligations. She is a British citizen. So the position remains that um, why at the end of the day when there's been such hysteria, quite rightly, about the actions of ISIS, which has murdered hundreds of thousands of individuals, um, subjected them to rape, to persecution. Um, why is it that we would want British citizens to remain in countries like Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and causing problems there? We have an obligation to bring them back. If they have broken the law, they must be investigated, they should be prosecuted, and they should be sent to jail. But secondly to that, there is a second um, pressing matter in regards to this, that this individual was 15 years old at the time. She was groomed. She was radicalized. Um, there was individuals within this country who we have seen very little about or heard very little of from the security services about who these individuals were that facilitated that, who I regard as serious organized criminal. They use religion as a front, yet the fact is that they facilitated um, the trafficking of these young girls to um, Syria and those people, sh the information on that should be provided to the security service and to the police by these individuals who return back to this country. Okay, let's just, let's just pull apart some of those strands for a moment on whether the Home Secretary will try to uh, prevent her from coming mm -hmm. back. He has said, if you've supported terrorist organizations abroad, I will not hesitate to prevent your return. He has temporary exclusion orders. Yes. Presumably you agree that he can use those to prevent her return for a time. Uh, absolutely. We, we have temporary exclusion orders, but they've been used far and few between. At the end of the day, Shamima Begum is an individual, and I do not defend her conduct. Her conduct is abhorrent. The fact that some of the statements that we've heard um, in, in recent days, or, um, where it just seems to be extremely dismissive, or supportive of IS. So one can understand the concerns for public safety, and that should be paramount within this country. But the situation remains that she is an individual who, at the age of 15, was trafficked to Syria. She had two children who have died and she is um, about to have another child and she is a British citizen so we do have international obligations so the question is first of all whether she was involved in any terrorist action whether she poses any threat to this country but we have seen in recent times individuals returning to this country uh, and the matter remains that yes I can see the Home Secretary um, and other individuals in the government um, pontificating in public but they also know that they're, they, they're, their hands are tied pretty much in terms of our international laws. Is, you, you've said that she was a 15 year old who was groomed Yes. Um, if she supported a terrorist organization or if an individual supported mm -hmm. a terrorist organization, is it um, mitigation that they were groomed if at the age of 19 they're saying, you know, that they were unfazed to see severed heads in, in bins, that they have no regrets and feel no remorse? Well, it would be mitigation, but that mitigation is at the end of a court process. When somebody is prosecuted and if they are found, the evidence is found against them beyond reasonable doubt and they are sent to prison um, or whatever the, the judge in that case decides, then mitigation would be something that a lawyer would stand up and say, well, the background to this, that she was trafficked. She was a vulnerable child who went across. And if we remove the word IS, and let's just imagine she happened to be somebody who was groomed and sent across by sex traffickers and married off to somebody, um, you know, underage, then that would be seen as statutory rape, um, it would be seen as sexual abuse. But if that person remained in the custody of those individuals for some four or five years, one can imagine the process that that has of brainwashing, of um, you know, radicalizing, which is what's happened with, with IS here. But the situation remains, she is an adult. So she has partaken in any terrorist atrocities. And quite clearly, IS is a proscribed organization that is banned in this country. And she, she claims that she is a member of that, then she should face the full weight of the law. But the position remains as this. If we really care about the, the atrocities that IS have carried out, if we really care about the impact of these individuals in societies such as Syria and Iraq that have been torn to pieces as a result of this barbaric death cult, then surely we have an obligation to ensure that rogue individuals, British citizens, are not allowed to remain in refugee camps and in these countries, but they are brought back to this country and we meet our obligations. So, so coming to um, a, another strand of your first answer, you mm -hmm. talked about um, serious organized criminals who were yes. involved in radicalizing 
sexualizing and trafficking um, these teenage girls. Um, do you feel not enough is being done to identify those people and prosecute them? Uh, absolutely. We have seen only a handful of prosecutions of these individuals and the fact remains that whilst we have on one level the security services repeatedly over the last three years saying that hundreds if not thousands of individuals, have, young individuals, have travelled out from this country to join IS, that the question mark remains that if they know who these individuals are and they have the, the numbers in their hands, then the question mark remains that if you're a 15 year old, 16 year old, 17 year old, you know, um, you are able to gain, somebody is providing you the money, somebody is radicalizing you, somebody is talking to you, somebody is finding you the, the, the be all and end all and whether it takes six months or whether it takes a year and then getting you over to Turkey and then getting you over to Syria. Who are these individuals? And the concern really should be this, that if these people are returning to this country, and today IS is hopefully coming towards an end, but tomorrow will perhaps be another organization. And the question remains, who are these individuals within our midst who are operating in the dark shadows? It's all very well to sort of be screaming hysterically about returning jihadi brides, so-called jihadi brides, yet no questions over who, who took them there? Who put them there? And, uh, and also, uh, there's another question that still remains. is never really been answered by the British government or by our security services. When we have a heightened state of alert over the last three years at our airports, where we see people, you know, uh, uh, young and old, you know, white, black, Asian, Muslim, etc., everybody being checked. You know, um, there are security services at the airport, there's high alert, there's cameras, there's CCTV. How it was possible for three young girls, unaccompanied, underage, um, wearing headscarves, to be able to leave, to go to Turkey, which was a well-known staging post, to be able to cross from Turkey then into Syria. Why they were not stopped? There's never ever been any answers to that. Uh, uh, so, I mean, all these issues do require to be looked at uh, oh, uh, okay. before the I government sort of pontificates in public about this individual. On the case, on the question of who's pontificating about what, mm -hmm. um, different communities, um, I want to ask you about different perspectives on this, because yes. um, there are criticisms from some people in the Muslim community saying that the Home Secretary is... Um, is tougher on um, on uh, an ethnic minority Muslim than he might be on a on a teenage white girl. Do you think there's an element of truth in that? Well, I, I, I mean, uh, when you when you talk about communities, I think uh, it, it, there is a difficulty here because for, for media commentators, and no disrespect yourself, often talk about a Muslim, Muslim community that is homogeneous. Which Muslim community are you talking about? You're talking about Bengali? You're talking about Indian? You're talking about Pakistani? You're talking about Arabic? You're talking about African? Everybody has different points of view in this society, as do many white. I mean, I've seen many people within the Muslim community, for instance, in Glasgow, who have been vociferous in their condemnation of this person and said that she should not be allowed to return to this country. Yet you've seen white people who are saying that she should be allowed to return. So there's different and varying views. But I suspect that, um, that the Home Secretary is probably like, that, that criticism is prob probably valid because he probably does in a Conservative Party, which has um, been criticised from within um, by Baron Swasi about Islamophobia, um, about racism um, repeatedly, and it's probably likely to be more tougher um, or seen to be tougher um, on the Muslim community. But the, putting that aside, it's neither here or there. The question is the rule of law must abide. We have international obligations and we are a civilized society and we have to also put aside the the hysterical reactions that we see and deal with this also on a compassionate basis whether we like this individual or not the test of a civilized and a democratic society is how we treat our vulnerable how we treat our weak and also those who are despised which means those individuals who may be prosecuted and who may be sent to prison Emma such Amor, as Shamima and Begum. we're going to have to leave it there thanks Thank for you. joining us so that is the latest uh, in Washington, as we've just been saying, uh, within the last hour, President Trump declaring that state of national emergency to pay for his border wall with Mexico. It's expected that uh, with those emergency powers, he could raise several billions of dollars that would uh, help him pay for that. We'll be live with our correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue, who's in uh, Washington in just a few minutes. Well, President Trump also said this afternoon in Washington that the complete defeat of so-called Islamic State militants in Syria would be announced in the next 24 hours. Now that comes as the head of MI6 warned that governments in Europe should not become complacent about the threat from Islamist terror groups. Alex Young saying that both Islamic State and Al-Qaeda groups are preparing for further attacks despite being overcome militarily in the Middle East. Now he was speaking after 19-year-old Shamima Begum, who travelled to Syria to join the militants, said she wanted to come home to have her baby. Well, let's discuss this now with Raffaello Pantucci, who's Director of International Security Studies at RUSI, the uh, think tank on international uh, security and defence. Thanks very much for being with us. So a warning then from the head of MI MI6 that 
Even though IS are, uh, have clearly been defeated on the battlefield in Syria, they could still pose a real danger and Al-Qaeda as well. I mean, I think there's always a danger, and we've seen this repeatedly in the past, that when we've sort of declared a victory, we've seen some sort of a major success against one of these groups, we'll say, well, you know, that's concluded and that's resolved. I think the key point that Alex Younger is trying to make here is that these groups have not gone away. We may have seen them sort of lose territory in the case of IS, or we may have seen in the case of Al-Qaeda them seeming to return their attention to somewhere else, but they have their kind of longer-term ambitions and longer-term goals still in mind. And the groups themselves have not been eradicated, and their ideologies still resonate in different parts of the globe. So I think it's a really big danger at a moment like this, when we talk about the sort of the end of ISIS, or we talk about it losing all its territory in Syria and Iraq, that we therefore say, well, okay, that's resolved, that's moved, that's done, let's move on to the next thing. The reality is this will continue to be an issue in the back burner for some time yet. And, and what does he actually mean, the head of MI6, when he says that? He's talking about asymmetric war, effectively bombings in European cities, that kind of thing. Well, I think, you know, if we, if we just focus on ISIS for a minute, you know, you've got a group here which has got a very long history. It goes back to the sort of late 1990s in one shape or form. And over that time, it's sort of grown and shrunk. And what we saw a few years ago is it really grew to a very enlarged shape. And from that enlarged position, it was launching attacks in all sorts of places. And it controlled all this territory in Syria and Iraq. Before it got to this sort of enlarged state, it was actually a much more guerrilla movement um, that had shrunk back from an organization that was very focused on Iraq um, and that was launching terrorist attacks across the country in Iraq that then managed to grow up into this big thing. Now we're seeing it's losing all its terror, it's shrinking back down, but its warriors are still there and they're kind of returning to the hills to continue their kind of struggle. Um, if you just look at the sort of attack picture that you've seen in sort of Iraq and Syria over the past few uh, weeks and months, you know, you're seeing from being an organization that's focused on sort of territorial control control and you know being this sort of big organization that's got this giant caliphate to being much more of a kind of guerrilla movement that's gone back into the mountains that's launching pinpricks attacks against its enemies and those pinprick attacks will at the moment seem to mostly be taking place in Syria and Iraq but there is still the interest to potentially do it further afield and in places like the west uh, in western Europe or uh, other for places in uh, around the world. And uh, just a quick word about 19-year-old uh, Shamima Begum, who has said she wants to come back to Britain, having, having gone to Syria four years ago. Uh, are you worried that there are going to be a, a, quite a large number of people, perhaps like her, um, who are going to come back to Europe from Syria, who've been with, with Islamic State? I mean, there is quite a worrying contingent of uh, foreigners uh, in general, beyond just Western Europeans who went out to fight alongside ISIS. Uh, the individuals who are still there now are, for the most part, fairly hardened radicals who've been with the group for some time, who've received all sorts of training and have all sorts of connections. So these are people who are great concern to security services for very good reason. OK, uh, Raphael Pantucci uh, from Rusi, thank you very much indeed. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to BBC News. The family of a teenager from London who travelled to Syria to join the group that called itself Islamic State have said they would welcome a police investigation into her actions, but they think the government should help to bring her home. Shamima Begum, who is now 19 and pregnant, is living in a refugee camp. Ben Ando reports. Al-Hol refugee camp in northern Syria. It's here that Shamima Begum and hundreds of others have come after fleeing the imminent fall of the Islamic State. Now 19 and heavily pregnant, she may give birth at any moment. Her family have appealed to the British government to get her home, saying in a statement, As a British citizen, Shamima has every expectation to be returned to the UK and be dealt with under the British justice system. Shamima's child, who will also be British, has every right, as a total innocent, to have the chance to grow up in the peace and security of this home. Shamima left the UK four years ago with three friends. In interviews now, she seems unrepentant, and the Home Secretary said he wants to block her return, though it's not certain he can. It is morally unacceptable to refuse her entry, as well as legally unacceptable, because otherwise she would be stateless, and no person in the world can be stateless under the law. Her family say she'd been brainwashed, and some believe that process can be reversed. We have worked over the last 10 years with fairly hard-line violent extremists who have renounced their ideology, have remorse for their actions and have taken part actually in helping others move away from extremist tendencies and violent ideologies.
MI6 has warned that returnees can bring with them dangerous skills, and Shamima herself has said that she expects to face a police investigation and possibly terrorism charges. Ben Ando, BBC News. Nicola Benya here is a psychotherapist who runs a counselling service for families affected by radicalisation. She set it up in 2015 after her teenage son Rashid left the country and travelled to Syria to join IS. He was killed six months later. Nicola, thank you very much for being with us uh, on BBC News this afternoon. Um, let me ask you first of all, what sort of factors do you think need to be borne in mind before any decision is made about Shabimia's case? I think obviously I think the whole thing needs to be it's a case-by-case -case situation um, with any individual that's um, made that choice to go over and join sort of Daesh um, I think a thorough in, um, assessment of the individual is is, is required um, and, and again and then to process any investigation and possibly um, prosecution a lot of people will have read the interview she gave to the Times and, and heard the remarks uh, that she made and they will feel, well look, she isn't showing any signs of remorse, mm -hmm. uh, it's too great a risk to have her back here. What would you say to that? It's incredibly difficult to make that snap, um, snap decision from just a video and from what the words that she says. That's why I said a thorough ins assessment of her would be required because we're unsure whether she does actually have remorse um, from the words she's saying because actually she could be actually suffering um, from the effects of PTSD or trauma. And also you have to remember when somebody's out there um, there's very much um, they suffer from paranoia and um, they fear people around them um, and sort of you know so and I think that's what we need to bear in mind because actually even with my son when he was out there this is the kind of thing that he was um, sort of showing was this paranoid thoughts and um, because again people are watching them and listening to everything they're saying so they she also may be filtering what she's saying because of that fact what about then the sort of practicalities of this if she is brought back to this country, she is interviewed, she's debriefed, however that is handled. What about dealing with the kind of psychological effects of what she's experienced? If she is to have any hope of resuming what most people would refer to as normal everyday life? I mean, I would hope. I mean, the UK is very equipped to be able to deal with sort of these interventions. Um, so I would hope there would be a real wraparound sort of um, sort of intervention for not just Shamima but also her family, because I think my heart goes out to the family who have actually been actually been sort of experiencing this for many years, and and they are they are holding a life sentence themselves. And I would hope that they were being supported as well. Are you surprised that this seems to have come as uh, uh, so unexpected? to people because after all we've known a large number of fighters and supporters have gone to Syria and we knew that Islamic State was on the point of being defeated. Do you think there should have been more preparation for this? I think certainly. I mean, we've been talking about this for a couple of years, um, about returnees uh, and the complexity about it. Um, so I think um, it shouldn't come to a shock to, to any of us because, again, we have been talking about this. I mean, obviously, for the public, it's, it's security and safety is paramount, but we also have to um, sort of think about how we are going to, if, if we do decide to bring these people back. Nicola Benya here, uh, psychotherapist and founder of Families for Life. Thanks very much for being Thank with us you. since lunchtime. Well, that was Andy Burnham. Let me just tell you, we have news uh, coming in to us um, that the lawyer representing Shamima Begum's family, Shamima Begum, uh, the 19-year-old uh, who was in Syria, who still is in a refugee camp in Syria, who left uh, this country when she was a 15-year-old schoolgirl uh, to go to be with Islamic State. Anyway, the lawyer representing Shamima Begum's family has put out a statement saying that the family have been informed that she has given birth to a child. She was uh, heavily pregnant um, when she was interviewed by the Times newspaper in that uh, camp a few days ago. Uh, the statement says the family have not had direct contact with Shamima Begum, so they cannot verify this information. They are hoping to establish communications with her soon. Uh, BBC has uh, not yet had it confirmed from any other source that uh, she uh, has had a child. Um, the statement in full released by the family's lawyer, Mohammed Tasmin Akunji, reads as follows. We, the family of Shamima Begum, have been informed that Shamima has given birth to her child. We understand that both she 
and the baby are in good health. As yet, we have not had direct contact with Shamima. We are hoping to establish communications with her soon so that we can verify the above. So that is a statement released in full by the uh, Shamima Begum's family's lawyer, Mohammed Tasmin Akunji. And just to be clear then, we haven't had that confirmed ourselves here in the BBC newsroom, but that is coming in to us from the, uh, the family and the family's lawyer. So we'll bring you more detail on that, um, but the family's saying that uh, she has given birth. Hello, very good afternoon to you. The family of the teenager Shamima Begum, who left Britain four years ago to join so-called Islamic State in Syria, believe that she has given birth. Shamima Begum, who is now 19 years old, was found last week in a Syrian refugee camp by the Times newspaper. She told the paper she wanted to bring up her baby in Britain, as she had lost two other children while living with Islamic State. Well, the Begum's family lawyer, Mohammed Akunji, has tweeted this. We, the family of Shamima Begum, have been informed that Shamima has given birth to her child. We understand that both she and the baby are in good health, as yet we have not had direct contact with Shamima. We are hoping to establish communication with her soon. And Mr Akunji then went on to say that the baby that has been born is a boy. Well, our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford uh, is following the story for us and gave me this update. I should say this is not information that the BBC has been able to confirm from anyone in the camp that uh, Shamim's had a baby or that uh, she was indeed pregnant, but this is what the lawyer had to say. We, the family of Shamima Begum, have been informed that Shamima has given birth to her child. We understand that both she and the baby are in good health. As yet, we've not had direct contact with Shamima. We're hoping to establish communications with her soon so that we can verify the above. And uh, on his Twitter feed, the lawyer went on to say that it is a boy. So unverified by anyone at the BBC, but certainly the lawyer representing the family saying they've had some information that she may have given birth to a son in that camp. Now, of course, there's been a, a lot of controversy since this uh, news broke and the Times had the interview with her the other day, a controversy about whether she should be able to come back to the United Kingdom uh, and have her baby looked after if she has had a baby on the National Health Service and so on. D does the fact, if she has given birth, does, w would that make any difference to her ability to come back to the United Kingdom? I don't think it makes a massive amount of difference. The government made it pretty clear that they're not going to send anyone to go and get anyone out of these uh, refugee camps in northern Syria who might have been uh, there as part of the Islamic State group. Um, so I don't think that changes that and whether or not she's got a baby doesn't appear to change that position. If she was to get to a country with a recognised government and be able to get to a British consulate, uh, I think a, a woman with a young baby or a woman who was heavily pregnant either way uh, saying that they wanted to get documentation to come back to Britain. That's the difficult question uh, for the government. And I think their position has shifted a little bit since Friday. I, th I think they have sort of starting to accept that um, people who don't have any other s possible nationality uh, can rightly claim to be British citizens and maybe would have to have their return to Britain um, managed carefully. They'd have to be interviewed by police. They might up live in Britain under very strict conditions. They, they certainly would be in investigated. Um, there is an issue about what nationality any baby might have, but mm. I think, again, it looks pretty clear that if it could be verified that that was definitely the woman's baby um, and that woman didn't have any other nationality, then the baby would also probably have British nationality. So just to be clear, she is considered to be a British national, e even though she's in Syria? At the moment, in, unless the, the British government could find some other nationality she might have, then they would have to accept they couldn't render her stateless and therefore they'd have to accept that... Uh, she was British and that uh, therefore she had a right to come back to Britain. Uh, that's Daniel Sanford there, our Home Affairs correspondent. Well, meanwhile, President Trump has been tweeting about Islamic State, uh, saying that the alternative is not a good one in that we will be forced to release them. This is IS fighters. The US does not want to watch as these ISIS fighters permeate Europe, which is where they are expected to go. The United States is asking Britain, France, Germany and other European allies to take back over 800 ISIS fighters that we captured in Syria and put them on trial. 
So that was uh, what Donald Trump was saying. Now, just four years ago, Islamic State controlled vast areas of Syria and northern Iraq. It had taken control of Raqqa and Mosul, but the group's so-called caliphate has continued to shrink since then, and it's now less than one square kilometre on the Euphrates River. Militants are reported to be retreating and hiding amongst the local population as the battle for the village of Bagus enters its final stages. Well, Charlie Daggada is from America's CBS News Network and has more on the fight against so-called Islamic State. The final battle is in its final days, with ISIS pinned down to an area of around a quarter of a square mile. That's the update we got from the commander of the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces, Chia Farat. He said the final ISIS village of Bakus Vakani had not yet fallen, but his ground forces were holding fire and moving forward cautiously because so many civilians remain trapped as human shields. Military officials here say they severely underestimated the number of civilians inside that village when they launched the offensive to crush the last remnants of the so-called caliphate one week ago. First estimated to be around 1,500 people, more than twice that many have since flooded out this week, including many ISIS families. Hundreds of ISIS fighters reportedly surrendered this week, of the 450 or so militants were thought to be making a last stand. But there's no fighting in here. And when we last visited the front line on Thursday, we found SDF fighters on a more relaxed footing since the final offensive began. Apart from sporadic gunfire, a relative calm suggested that the brutal last battle might be coming to an end. Commander Farat vowed to broadcast to the world in the coming days the military end of ISIS. Now, he stressed military end because even U.S.-led coalition officials have said ISIS will remain a threat as an underground insurgency, which raises an important question about exactly when America's 2,000 troops will withdraw. Charlie Daggett of CBS News for BBC News in eastern Syria. Now, the London schoolgirl who joined the group that calls itself Islamic State in Syria but now wants to come home has apologised to the British public. But in an interview with the BBC, Shamima Begum equated terrorist attacks in the UK with what the International Coalition of Countries Fighting IS has been doing in Syria. The 19-year-old gave birth to a boy at the weekend. Our home affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford has more. Shamima Begum, who left her home in East London aged 15 to join the Islamic State group, explaining today what it was that inspired her to go. Was it because you watched some beheading videos? Is that right? I mean, not just the beheading videos, you know, the videos they show of, like, families and stuff in the park, you know, the good life that they can provide for you and all that. Like, not just the fighting videos, but, yeah, the fighting videos are hard, yes. She left Britain with two school friends travelling through Turkey to Syria and became a symbol of young British people joining IS. You helped them. You helped the enemy of Britain. But I wasn't the one that put myself... I didn't want to be on the news at first. I know a lot of people, after they saw that me and my friends came, they actually encouraged them. Like, I did hear, yeah, a lot of people were encouraged to come after I left, but I wasn't the one that put myself on the news. We didn't want to be on the news. She was asked what she thought about the Manchester bombing of 2017 in which 22 people died. She appeared to regret it, but then compared it with the coalition bombing of IS-held towns in Syria. I do feel that is wrong that people, like innocent people did get killed. It's like it's one thing to kill a soldier that is fighting you, you know, it's self-defense, but to kill people like women and children, just like people, you know, like the women and children in Bagus that are being killed right now unjustly. The bombings. It's, t it's a two-way thing, really, because women and children are being killed back in the Islamic State right now, and it's kind of retaliation. Like the, their justification was that it was retaliation, so I thought, okay, that is a, f a fair justification. Shamima Begum is asking to be allowed back to the UK. She said that if she's sent to prison, she'd like her family to look after her newborn baby boy, Daniel Sandford. BBC News. Well, with the US-led coalition close to announcing the defeat of IS in Syria and President Assad's forces retaking many of the areas that have been held by Syrian opposition groups, five and a half million refugees have started to consider whether to go home. The UN expects a quarter of a million to head back this year to Syria. Our Middle East correspondent Yolande Nell has been talking to some of those making the journey. 
This is the border with Syria. And after years of people fleeing a brutal civil war, every day now, there's a long queue to enter the country. So all these people are Syrians who've been staying in Jordan, but they've now decided to go home. And it's not an easy decision at all to go back because they're going to be giving up all of their rights as refugees. Mariam spent two years in a refugee camp. We want to go back to our country, to our house. There's nothing better. When we left, we hoped for calm. And now God has calmed everything. Since government forces retook rebel-held areas last year, there have been thousands of returns. Over time now that uh, people have actually been able to hear back from relatives of improved security, uh, we start to see an interest uh, of refugees to go back. At the Syrian embassy in Amman, refugees wait to sort out the paperwork they need to go home. It's costly. Musa has saved up $170 to register his daughter's birth in Jordan. Little Tukka is one of a million refugee babies born during the war. Soon her father plans to take her and all his family back to Dura. It's where Syria's uprising began. But after all the turmoil, Musa is glad President Assad wasn't overthrown. If Islamic State group, the Nusra Front and all those other fronts and factions had their way, Syria would have been divided into a thousand pieces. Instead, President Bashar al-Assad preserved a united Syria. Back at the border, more Syrians head home. Fighting has devastated much of their country, but people are desperate to rebuild their lives. Yolande Nell, BBC News, on the Jordan-Syria border. Hello, a very good morning to you and welcome to BBC Newsroom Live. I'm Anita McVeigh. The teenager who fled the UK to join the so-called Islamic State group says she's upset and frustrated that the Home Office has revoked her British citizenship. Shamima Begum said the decision was unjust on her and her newly born son. It's thought she may be eligible for citizenship of Bangladesh as her parents were born there. The Home Secretary Sajid Javid ordered the move against the 19-year-old who travelled to Syria to support IS in 2015. This report from Simon Jones. She wants to return home, but she's been told she's not welcome. Shamima Begum remains in a refugee camp in Syria. She joined the so-called Islamic State group when she was 15, but has now fled fierce fighting. She's just given birth after losing two previous children. I just want forgiveness, really, from the UK. Like, everything I've been through, I, I didn't expect I would go through that. And She's been accused of showing no remorse after she equated the children killed in the Manchester bombing two years ago with people being bombed by coalition forces in IS-held areas of Syria. Are you sure that Shamima Begum won't be left stateless, Home Secretary? The Home Secretary says his priority is the safety and security of Britain. In order to deprive someone of their British citizenship, the Home Secretary needs to be satisfied that it's conducive to the public good and that they've conducted themselves in a manner seriously prejudicial to the interests of the UK. He must also be sure they are able to become a national of another country. The Home Office believes Shamima Begum is eligible for Bangladeshi citizenship, as her mother is thought to be a Bangladeshi national. Although this power is now used quite a bit, like about a hundred times in recent years, it never used to be used very much. It's normally used on people who are serious terrorists, occasionally on other types of serious criminal. Uh, we don't know how serious this woman's criminality was in Syria, if indeed she broke UK law at all. Her family is considering all legal avenues to contest the decision. The birth of her baby boy, whom she was carrying underneath her clothes when the BBC interviewed her, further complicates the situation. The, the baby is entitled to British nationality. Um, the baby is probably entitled to Bangladesh nationality. And the baby's father is Dutch. Dutch law is a little different. If the father, who apparently is still alive, avows that the baby, says that the baby is his, as uh, he appears to be, then the baby can also uh, receive Dutch nationality. 
The question of Miss Begum's citizenship is a matter for the British authorities, according to Bangladesh's foreign secretary. Any appeal could take years, so this refugee camp is likely to remain her home for the foreseeable future. Simon Jones, BBC News. Let's speak now to the human rights lawyer, David Haig. He joins me via webcam from Penzance. Uh, David, morning to you. Good morning. What do you make of the Home Office's defence or rationale for uh, starting this move? It says that Shamima Begum is eligible for nationality of another country, namely Bangladesh, uh, because of her parents. I mean, I understand the concern that, that, that people, you know, the public have, and it may be that that's pressurised the Home Office into what appears to be a knee-jerk reaction um, into, into depriving of her, of her English citizenship. So you think this is a, a political stand by the Home Office rather than necessarily a, a process, a judicial process? I, I think that's, that's quite a possibility. And it's, a judicial process is what it should be, um, and not one by an elected official, essentially, which the, 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 the um, Home Office Minister is. So that's of a great concern, I think. And, you know, we, would we be looking at the same situation had uh, Miss Begum on her interview actually got the sympathy of the people and had she cried and showed remorse? Would we be having this discussion today? Uh, what are the next steps then? I, I mean, I think we, we, we've already seen that her family is clearly going to challenge um, the, the decision of the Home Office. We've seen from previous precedent that they can go all the way up to the Supreme Court, consider also European courts. Um, and then, as, as, as earlier in your programme you mentioned, you've then got the father's nationality, the Bangladeshi nationality, the child. It's a very complicated matter that's going to go on for years. Uh, the Bangladeshi authorities say that this is a matter concerning the British authorities and that Bangladesh doesn't know anything about the matter. Does that statement make any difference to the case that the UK is building? Well, it's, it's, it's unclear as to, to exactly on what basis they are, are, they basically said that she has nationality. It appears that she, she's entitled to nationality in Bangladesh, but at the present time she doesn't have it. Um, so whether or not due process has been followed in, in Britain and the existing laws is also a question. Then there is the question of uh, Shamima Begum's uh, baby son. Um, what uh, complexities, if you like, does that add to the case? I mean, potentially could the authorities here in the UK treat the baby separately from the way they treat the mother? Well, that, that's the problem. As, as, you know, another problem, you've, you've technically got three potential nationalities or three nationalities for the child, obviously, with, with Bangladesh there. You've got England and potentially the Netherlands. And so... Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated uh, problem in terms of various jurisdictions um, and not made any easier, obviously, in terms of Brexit even might have a, a, an implication on that. OK, David Haig, thank you for your time this morning and your thoughts on that case. David uh, Haig, human rights lawyer. Now, Shamima Begum, the 19-year-old who left Britain to join the Islamic State group four years ago, has told the BBC she expected more sympathy from Britain. It follows the Home Secretary's decision to try to strip her of her British citizenship. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sanford, reports. In the al Hal refugee camp in Syria, a clearly deflated Shamima Begum. The 19-year-old who left school to join IS and has just given birth had appealed for help to return to the UK, but learnt today the government was instead taking away her British nationality, though her baby, who she was carrying under her clothes, will still be British. I thought they'd be a bit more sympathetic because of my situation and I did explain that I didn't know fully what I was getting into and, you know, I made a mistake and I was hoping that I'd, I'd have some sympathy. And understanding, but clearly not. Secretary Sajid Javid. In Parliament, the Home Secretary explained why the government has deprived so many people who went to join IS of their nationality. Where they pose any threat to this country, I will do everything in my power to prevent their return. This includes stripping dangerous individuals of their British citizenship. This power is only used in extreme circumstances where conducive to the public good. It has been suggested that Sajid Javid made the decision partly for political reasons, to look tough and to enhance his leadership ambitions, but he insisted it had been looked at by experienced government lawyers and officials here at the Home Office, and it was an absolutely lawful decision.
Shamima Begum left Britain as a 15-year-old schoolgirl. At the time, police said she'd been groomed. Now, four years later, she's losing her British citizenship and being told to rely on her possible Bangladeshi nationality through her mother. Well, they're kind of being unjust, and I don't think they're actually allowed to do that because, like I said, I don't have a dual citizenship. I only have one citizenship, and if you take that one thing away from me, I don't have anything, and I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to do that. Some immigration lawyers question the fairness of the decision, which would not even have been legal if she'd been of completely British heritage. If there is evidence of wrongdoing, she should be prosecuted in a court of law in this country. And if there isn't sufficient evidence to prosecute her, then how on earth could you inflict the severest penalty upon her without any recourse to a court of law? Shamima Begum's appeal is likely to take months to go through the courts. And this evening, the Bangladeshi foreign minister said he was deeply concerned that she'd been wrongly identified as a holder of dual citizenship. He said there was no question of her being allowed to enter Bangladesh. Daniel Sandford, BBC News. Um, more now on the news that uh, Shamima Begum, the 19-year-old who left Britain to join the Islamic State group four years ago, says that she expected more sympathy from Britain following the Home Secretary's decision to try to strip her of her British citizenship. Well, joining me now via webcam from South London is the immigration and asylum lawyer, Jacqueline McKenzie. Uh, Jacqueline, thank you for joining us there. Um, do you know what? There, there seems to be a lot of confusion over the interpretation of immigration laws in the UK and Bangladesh. Could you just take us through where we are right now in terms of citizenship? Well, it, it is confusing. Now, I can't say anything about Bangladeshi citizenship laws. I don't know anything about that. But in terms of the UK, as we understand it, Miss Begum is British, and she's British in a way that's described as other than by descent, which means that she can then pass on her citizenship to any child she has, whether the child was born in the UK or not. So what we do know is that we had two British people. Now, we understand that the Home Secretary has issued a deprivation order so that she's been deprived of her British citizenship. Um, and the next stage for her is to appeal that by making an application to a tribunal called the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. In terms of Bangladesh, I understand the latest news from there, and, and, and it goes to why the Home Secretary felt that he was able to do this on the basis that she had a claim to Bangladeshi citizenship. I understand that the latest news is that Bangladesh is saying she doesn't. Okay, um, yeah, in terms of the Bangladeshi law, I understand that this was attempted um, a few years ago in the cases, two cases uh, that we know simply as E3 and N3. Uh, there is an appeal coming up later where this Bangladeshi um, right of uh, citizenship by descent was applied and uh, the government was told that they can't do that. But it's all about eligibility, isn't it? And the problem with Shamima is that she's below the age of 21. Well, yes, I mean, that bit of it isn't very clear. But what the UK government is saying is that if you've got parentage from another country, then and their laws allow you to claim dual nationality as a result of that parentage, then you can do so. And it looks as though someone's just assumed, well, she will be entitled to it, so she's got it. But she has to make an application and go through the process through the Bangladeshi system. And that doesn't appear to have happened. And further, we understand that Bangladesh is saying that she is not Bangladeshi. OK, and very quickly, there is another um, human being involved here, and that is um, her child. Yes. Where do we stand there? Well, as far as I can see, that child's British. Now, one of the problems on commenting on this case is that we know very, very little. We really don't know enough. We don't know who the father is. We understand she was married to a Dutch man. There's a lot of assumption that he's the father. But we don't know if the child can take his uh, citizenship. There's even talk I've seen today that the child might even be Bangladeshi. You don't know where that comes from. What we do know is that the child's British. And were that child to be able to avail itself uh, through a family member or somebody else of a travel document or a British passport and arrive in the UK, we have to admit that child. OK, um, Jacqueline McKenzie, we're, we're hoping we'll get some clarity on this over the next few days, but thank you very much for that. Thank you. Well, the case of Shamima Begum and the other schoolgirls from Bethnal Green highlighted the issue of young Muslim women becoming radicalised and making the journey to Syria.
A correspondent, Sabia Purvez, has been speaking to four women from Muslim backgrounds in Bradford to gauge their views on the case and the risks of radicalization. My name is Rosma and I'm a youth cafe coordinator in Bradford. Hi, my name is Samar. I'm a PhD student in PISA studies. I'm Hiba Maru, I'm 20 years old and I work in media. I'm Saf and I'm a boxer from Bradford. Coming. Hi. We're in a restaurant in Bradford with four young women from Muslim backgrounds discussing the questions arising around Shamima Begum's desire to return home to the UK. She was 15 at the time, she's now 19, it's four years later and she's saying, okay, I've, I'm pregnant and I want to come back. Do you think she should be allowed to come back to the UK? It's not the kid's fault and the kids should be able to have a chance here. But obviously she should be um, she should be like she should take responsibility for her actions. We need to think of it as we're giving the baby a chance to take advantage of the healthcare system, not we're not mm. doing it for her. No one really cares exactly. if she's taking advantage of it or not. She says that she has no remorse and she talks about the fact that, you know, when she saw severed heads in the bins it didn't phase her. Personally I don't feel comfortable to have someone who doesn't have a remorse and is still believing that utopia that she's created or she's been seduced to reach. So okay. you've been groomed, you then think this is your way of life and this is it appeals to you. But her decision to fly all the way to, to, to Syria, to get board that plane, to go through security, to land, to get there, to have this life, is all on her. So what needs to be done then to make sure that people like Shamima Young people like Shamima don't go out there. We need to talk. We need to stop this stiff upper lip society where we don't want to talk about things. We need to start talking. We need to live in a society where we can have these open, frank discussions where we all have different opinions, but we can talk about them around the table. As questions are left unanswered on the future of Shamima Begum, it is clear from the discussions here that more needs to be done to protect vulnerable young people from being groomed by radical fundamentalists. Sabir Pavez, Bradford. Well, our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Salford is here. Daniel, Shamima Begum's case, it is a complicated one, but is it actually clear that she'll even be allowed back in the UK in the first place? Well, she could be barred from the country. There are ways of doing that. She could be barred temporarily while she's investigated, or she could have her passport taken away. It looks like that's unlikely in this case. But it does highlight the dilemma that there is around this whole issue. It may seem easy at first to say, oh, we're just not going to let anyone come back from Islamic State. But when you probe down into the detail, it gets more difficult. There may be some people who've committed such heinous crimes that you actually want to bring them back, put them on trial and lock them up for the rest of their lives. At the other end of the scale, there may be people who went there as toddlers, who are still now of only primary school age, are you going to say that they can't come back and try and start a life with other family, uh, perhaps in Britain? Shemima Begum comes somewhere in the, in the middle. You know, on the one hand, she went there aged 15. Uh, police at the time said she'd been groomed. She was a victim, uh, and so she could be looked at in that way. On the other hand, she's now 19, and she says that she doesn't regret going, and that's a sort of adult uh, decision. So she falls a little bit somewhere in the middle, and it's a, it's a hard case, and there's going to be a lot more hard cases over the next few months as we discover how many UK citizens went to join Islamic State and have actually survived. Sure. OK. Daniel, thank you. Daniel Sanford there. Thank you very much. Back in 2015, three British schoolgirls, two who were 15 and one who was 16, from Bethnal Green in East London, left the country to join the brutal regime of so-called Islamic State in Syria. It shocked most of us. Now, one of them, 19-year-old Shamima Begum, is pleading to come home. Speaking from a Syrian refugee camp, she says she's nine months pregnant and has no regrets about heading for ISIS territory with her two friends four years ago. She went there with 16-year-old Khadiza Sultana, seen here on the left, and 15-year-old Amira Abbas, seen here on the right, after they told their parents they were going out for the day. They were caught on CCTV travelling to Turkey before crossing the Syrian border. It's believed one of the teenagers, Khadiza Sultana, was killed in a Russian airstrike in 2016. When they first went out to Syria, Shamima Begum's sister, Renu, asked her to come home in an emotional appeal. This is my little sister's pyjamas. She didn't take anything with her. She, did, she didn't take anything with her. Um, we're kind of just clinging on to the bits that we have. 
and we just want her to come home. If if you watch this, baby, please come home. Mum needs you more than anything in the world. Um, you're our baby, um, and we just want you home. We want you safe. Just contact anybody. Let them know that you need help, and you've got all the help in the world. You're not in any trouble here. We all love you. If if anybody has convinced you of anything, then they're wrong. We love you more than anybody that could ever love you, and. That's about it. We're just holding on to hope that she hasn't gone to do anything stupid. She's she's gone to get her friend because it's in her kind nature to do something like that, to bring back a friend, and that's that's what we're hoping she's gone to do, bring back a friend. That was four years ago. Now Shamima Begum has been tracked down by a Times journalist. She told Anthony Lloyd from a Syrian refugee camp that she was taken to a house in Raqqa when she got to Syria with other newly arrived jihadi brides-to-be. She said she'd seen many atrocities, including heads that had been severed from bodies. But it hadn't bothered her. Have a listen to this. What was that like? Was that uh, an experience which fulfilled your aspirations of what it was? Yeah, it actually really did. It was like a normal life. The life that they show on the propaganda videos, you know, it's a normal life. But every now and then there are bombs and stuff, but other than that, you know. Did you ever see executions? No, no, I never. Uh, no, but I saw a beheaded head in the bins. In the bins? Yeah, it's really bin. What was that like when you first saw that? These are the heads of captives? Yeah. I was, didn't pay me at all. Shamima Begum says she's now nine months pregnant after losing two children in the last year while living in Syria. One to malnutrition, she says, one to illness. Now, she wants to come back to Britain, which she calls home. I have to think about my baby as well. After my two kids died, I just, now I'm really overprotective of this baby. I'm scared that this baby's gonna get sick in this camp. That's why I really wanna get back to Britain, because I know it will be taken care of. Like health drive at least. Shamima Begum was also asked whether she believed Islamic State's days of ruling vast swathes of territory across Syria and Iraq were over and whether she had any regrets about travelling to join the terrorist organisation. She appeared to show no remorse. Do you think this is the end of the caliphate? Yeah, I really do. I don't have high hopes. They're just getting smaller and smaller. And there's so much oppression, going, oppression and corruption going on that I don't really think they deserve victory. On the one hand, you don't. You said you didn't regret coming to be part of the caliphate. No, I don't regret it. But on the other hand, but when I came and I saw that there was a, there was like underground oppression and all this happening, it came with a shock to me. Like this is actually happening. This morning, the security minister Ben Wallace gave this message to those who want to return here from Syria. If you have been out there. Uh, against the advice of, of the Foreign Office to go and engaged in support or activities of terrorism, you should be prepared to be, if you come back, prepared to be questioned, investigated and potentially prosecuted for committing terrorist offences. Well, let's talk now to Dal Babu, who's a former Metropolitan Police Chief Superintendent. And four years ago, he was brought in by Shamima Begum's family to support them and to try and help. Also with us, Mesa Gifford, that's not his real name. Uh, he left his career as a banker to fight ISIS in Syria. And Nikita Malik is here, director of the Center on Radicalization and Terror at the Henry Jackson Society. That is a group which promotes liberal ideas. Thank you all very much for coming on the program. Um, Dal Babu, you have heard from the family since the news of that Shamima Begin is alive and wants to return to the UK. What do they say? Well, it's a public record. The family are want, want her back. Uh, you played a clip of uh, Renu, the sister who made a heartfelt um, plea for Shamila to come back. Um, I think these girls, the three girls, were, we're talking about 15-year-old children who were uh, groomed. They were on the internet, they were radicalised, the families had no idea whatsoever about what was going on. Uh, the families assumed they were going to a wedding, getting ready for a wedding, and they disappeared. 
so I think we, we really need to understand that we've got 15 year old children uh, who were, uh, I appreciate she's now 19, but these were individuals who were groomed uh, and we see this happening on the internet all the time unfortunately. You look at issues uh, around Rotherham, you look at issues around Rochdale, Thames Valley, where young women have been abused. Uh, they think they're in relationships now here and listening to... Uh, and, you say, and you think this is on a par? Well, yeah, I, I think this is uh, an individual. I mean, th sh what she's talking about, ISIS, is a brutal regime. Mm. Brutal, absolutely brutal. Nobody in their right mind would think it's an appropriate organisation if you look at what they do. But, but is the family appealing for understanding, for people to understand what you have just described, that their daughter, their sister has been groomed and that, that she, she should be allowed to return to Britain? Well, the, well she, she, she was born in this country, she, you know, she's had birth, she's had a, she had a normal life mm. until she was groomed. And I think what we need to be doing is looking at what the authorities did in terms of what information they had. Uh, famously, or infamously, they, a letter was written because the authorities, the PREVENT team, were aware that these girls were being groomed, and the PREVENT team gave a letter to the girls themselves, despite them knowing that these girls were being groomed on the internet to give to their parents. Now, not surprisingly, the girls didn't give that letter about their concerns they had, and the letter was found in the girls' uh, school bag after they'd gone. Uh, Mesa Gifford, you went out there to uh, fight ISIS. Just remind people how vile ISIS have been. Well, one thing I've been shocked actually is how little remorse these ladies have got, or this lady particularly, that um, the Islamic State cut a terrible swathe of violence throughout the Middle East. They've killed thousands of uh, people, uh, young boys and young men in ditches. They've sold Yazidis in cages. Uh, they've thrown gay men off buildings. Uh, this is uh, an, a terrorist organization. And this lady uh, went out roughly around the same time that I went out. Uh, I went out motivated by what I'd, been, what I'd seen online. Uh, uh, and so did she. So we can't sort of absolve her from responsibility by saying that she's been, uh, that she's been groomed. Except how old were you when you went out? Well, I was 27. Right. Um, but still, she was 15. Mm. Uh, when I was 15, I knew murder was wrong. I knew uh, rape, murder, kidnapping, all the vile things that ISIS had done was wrong. Yet she chose to go out there. And there's no indication that first she has any remorse, that she's any less dangerous uh, as a potential terrorist. Lord knows what she's been taught out there. So she's still a threat to people in the UK. And I, and I hope people sort of recognize that and, and she gets a, the appropriate punishment. Should she be allowed home? I, th um, I think that's a really uh, tough question. Um, in my opinion, I would actually argue that she shouldn't uh, because they are uh, appropriate processes to try an individual in Iraq and Syria. I also think I if she's committed any offense. I think she has by joining by knowingly joining a terrorist organization. Even when you're 15? She, uh, even if you're 15, I, I think this needs to be situated in, in, in the fact that these girls did an enormous amount of research before they went out. You know, we, and I, I've done uh, reports on this myself, where girls are actively seeking out this information. I think saying that it's just down to grooming is actually reducing the free will of these individuals. These girls uh, downloaded propaganda. They, they sought out uh, relationships with people online. It's very different from an Iraqi or Syrian girl who may have been abducted into Islamic State out of uh, no choice of her own. This is somebody who chose to get on a plane and go to Can join. I, would you say the girls that were groomed at Rochdale by men? I don't think... Would, 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 would I you don't let me finish, please. Mm -hmm. Would you say the girls that were groomed uh, in Rochdale did it of their own free will? But this is not the same. This is not even so near the what, same. So those, Someone, those some 15 year old girls in Rochdale that were thought they were in relationships with men that would double their age, would you say that but was free will? With, with respect, that is a complete, and I think it's completely inaccurate to put those two situations together. Because here you have a girl who has actively downloaded information, boarded a flight, gone and joined a terrorist organization where she probably had a slave who had been, you know, we're talking about women's rights, she probably had a slave who had been abducted by the Islamic State. Uh, you know, she saw horrible things being done to women. She saw beheading. She saw a head in the bin. I don't think that this is nearly the same as, as uh, a situation where a man is sexually exploiting a young girl. Uh, and I think uh, conflating the two is extremely problematic because here we have a terrorist organization that an individual has joined. And just because she's a girl or a woman doesn't make her any less than a, a man well, I, I who think, would join you know, the A 15-year-old girl who thinks it's appropriate to get married to a 27-year-old man 
uh, is very problematic. And I think it illustrates that these individuals were groomed. They had no sense. And if you listen to her now, what really, well, she really struck me... She doesn't do herself any favours no, in the No, absolutely. No, no. I think she expresses no remorse, no regrets. No. She justifies the but killing of, ju of journalists and says they might have been spies. Mm. Uh, she, she says she was le uh, weak for leaving the battlefield in, in eastern mm. Syria and so on. But her own husband was actually held and tortured himself. Because they thought, so. So, so what's your point? Well, th this is b a bizarre way of thinking. That's, that's my point. Mm -hmm. Is uh, so. I think the reality of the situation is that, unfortunately, the internet grooms and manipulates individuals, and 15 year children are victims of the manipulation that goes on the internet. And I think what we need to understand is how these individuals get manipulated. Um, um, I, you know, okay. I've, I've got, but I think you know, children. We need to understand how vulnerable children are. Okay. So you view her as a victim still, even though the security minister Ben Wallace said this morning, people who went there went out there as amateurs are now professionals, either as fighters, professional fighters, or professional supporters. Well, we have a legal process, and it's important that we go through that legal process. So, you know, I, 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 I you know, if, if if somebody comes here with a child, there'll be concerns about how that child's being brought up. So, you know, I think she's she's unaware of what the what potentially may happen. The child, there'll be a case conference, social workers, police will be involved, and so there's no guarantee that the the child that she talks about will remain with her. Mm. So th these are complex issues, and we have to abide by the international law. Most people who are contacting our program and have been contacting me all morning are not sympathetic at all. Paul texts this, uh, Shamima needs to publicly repent and then renounce her IS beliefs, then accept she's broken the law and then accept punishment. Francis says she should not be allowed to return to the UK, she has no regrets. We don't want traitors returning here, neither she nor the child are wanted here. Uh, this texter says the IS teenager should not be allowed to come back to Britain unless she's arrested as a traitor. Jerome tweets this, she has no regrets, she supports jihad. British people being killed, related attacks in the UK, she made her bed. Who knows what she's actually done? At best she's an accomplice and she's trying to use her unborn child as a weapon. Why should the British taxpayer foot the bill for her? And there are, there are many more. I mean, she may want to come back, but in terms of whether it's practically or physically possible. I mean, she's in a Syrian refugee camp. There are obviously no British consular officials out there, no British authorities. What is the process by which she might be able to get back? Well, she is in the care of the SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, they do have a judicial process where they're processing their own fighters, mm. uh, but their message is quite clear. They want the European nations, where thousands of young men and women came out to destroy Syria and butcher people, they want them to take responsibility for their citizens and take them back. So uh, there's two options. One, I want the British government to stiffen legislation to make certain that ladies like this one are properly dealt with. Um, or if we can't do that, and there's a fear that we, we can't successfully prosecute them, then we need to provide local people in Syria with the resources to do the job for us, um, which they're more than capable of doing. So, will yeah, you, will you of remind our audience, when you came back, were mm -hmm. you questioned? <clears throat> I was indeed, yes. I, well, I, I fit into a sort of a legal grey area. I went out to fight the Islamic State. I joined the YPG initially, which is the People's Protection Units. Um, I joined the SDF, which is supported by the Americans and by the Brits. Um, and I've been in cooperation with uh, anti-terror officials in the UK. I've told them everything that I've done. So um, let me put this clear. to you. It is an argument by a minority uh, a group of, you know, uh, not very many people, a minority who are saying the unborn child is an innocent. Shamima Begum, the mother, is a British citizen. Citizen. Do we have a duty of care to that child? Now that I agree with. I think the, <clears throat> the child has, has committed no crime. Um, again, to clarify, I do believe that by joining Islamic State, her citizenship has been stripped. Um, because she has joined a terrorist organization. I may be wrong about that. I, I'm not a lawyer. However, the child, and we have seen this with cases in the past, can be uh, given uh, British citizenship because of the DNA, through a DNA test of the mother, in which case, if we do bring the child to the UK, they would require, um, you know, uh, probably uh, to be put into care. They would require um, very close uh, monitoring for their development. Um, and, and it's almost certain that they should not be kept with her because she knowingly took a child to a conflict zone where they would be exposed to extreme danger and that is why she's lost two already. Uh, if she had a duty of responsibility to her children, she would have stayed in the UK where they would have been safe and instead she chose to go to a, a war zone and, and have her children there for the Islamic State. 
What will the police and security services be doing now in terms of assessing how much of a risk, if any risk at all, she is to people in Britain? Well, they'll follow the law, which will require them to, uh, anybody who comes back will be interviewed, um, they will be assessed, and then they'll make a decision, uh, particularly when there's a child involved, whether it's appropriate for the mother to be with the child. So, so there, there, there will be a huge amount of resources put in there. Um, and, and that's another issue in terms of uh, a time when the police have had such a dramatic cut in their resources. This will require a lot of uh, men and women to ensure that an individual comes back is, is appropriately dealt with, but also the, the wider community feels safe. Uh, Zayed on email says the biggest shame in all this is that she has brought, been brought up on the incorrect Islamic belief which has made her radical and this is what needs to be corrected first. Texter says no one should be allowed to come back to Britain who supported ISIS. I lost my son to them in 2016. She is evil. Bill emails to say the baby yes but not the mother. The mother is dangerous and unrepentant. Uh, Ian says this, Shamima Begum should be offered the opportunity to return to the UK where she should immediately be taken into custody but only on condition she provides the security services with sufficient information to their satisfaction regarding her fellow traitors and the infrastru infrastructure of ISIS to assist in the group's ultimate destruction. Could she be of use in the future? I think she would be of use uh, in the sense of the intelligence. So there has been a case of a woman coming back from Islamic, uh, Islamic State, Tharina Shakil, who came back with a child. Uh, there's also been another case, um, I'm releasing some research on this next Wednesday, but of a family who had a child in Syria and was brought back. Mm -hmm. They have to engage with the government's desistance and disengagement uh, program, which is created for returnees. Now, if they do that to a sufficient extent, uh, you know, I don't know if they're allowed uh, to be reunited with their children, but I think they are allowed to have some time with them. And that is why a lot of these women have cooperated with this program. Now, the extent to which de-radicalization is actually possible when somebody is not disillusioned with the Islamic State, you know, she has come on, she's spoken to An Anthony and said that uh, I don't... He's a Times journalist. Exactly, yep. a Times journalist, and said, you know, from, from what I've heard, she doesn't seem disillusioned. Uh, you know, she, she could uh, potentially still be dangerous. Dangerous. And so the intelligence sharing or what she's able to provide uh, to either the British authorities or the Syrian and Iraqi authorities will be instrumental uh, in, in assisting us uh, in, in understanding what role she played uh, in the organization. Uh, I want to read this final email for the moment, if I may. Uh, Maria on email. I'm a Muslim. I'm a practicing Muslim. I follow a peaceful and simple life. I'm 23. Uh, and I think that no matter how charitable the UK may be, there is a line that must be drawn, and that line is terrorism. Clearly, she has no regrets. She now sees the so-called caliphate as shrinking, and it's sad to see a child having been groomed and have lost two children herself. However, she still does not sound like she thinks uh, terrorism is wrong. She just thinks that ISIS is growing weak and she isn't getting what she probably hoped for, so she shouldn't be allowed back. I'm sorry, I truly feel bad for her, but one day I will have children in this country. And if her raised child goes around spreading a new terrorist organization, then I fear for my children in the future. Uh, as a Muslim, I don't blame anyone to think twice when they say it's the fault of terrorism and this girl should be punished by not being allowed a home. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Uh, will, you, I mean, will you deliver those kind of messages back to the family? Well, I, I think the family are very, very keen to make sure that their loved one uh, is kept safe. Uh, and I think we just need to remember that this was a child who was groomed. Uh, and we, we seem to have a, a, a much more sympathy with the young girls who were victims of sexual abuse. Uh, who were, uh, who've, when you talk to those individuals, they will think they're in relationships. And I'm afraid what, you, what we're seeing is a, a woman who's been radicalized, who's, who's a, a victim of that kind of brainwashing. Okay. Uh, and I think we just need to understand that these were children when they went there. And I think there is a very, very strong message, if I can just end on this, is that we need to make sure that the internet is regularized. So these organizations that prey on our children, prey on the weak, and groom our children, whether it's about radicalization, whether it's about sexual abuse, whether it's about gambling, are dealt with more efficiently. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. We appreciate your time.